Well, good morning, everyone. So glad you can be able to join us for our worship service. Now, I'm sure we can think about times in our lives where it seems as if everything seems to be in chaos. Everything seems to be out of control, but actually, in reality, things are in control. Let me give you an example. There once was two individuals who walked into a Supercenter store, and they had the intention of stealing some big name brand clothes. So they got all the clothes that they wanted to steal, they walked into one of the dressing rooms, and they pretended to try them on. But then, when they walked out, they told one of the, uh, the employees there that, oh, we, d we don't want these clothes anymore, so we left them in the, in the changing room. But in reality, they had stuffed all of their clothes that they wanted to steal into a bag, and they're on the way out of the store. The employee noticed, started to confront them, a big argument uh, came out, and more people got involved. And then these in two individuals, they decided to just try to run out of the, the store. They made it outside, but all of a sudden, they were just tackled by a giant security guard. So things were in control, but do you know why? Because the security guard, he was able to see on the security cameras everything that was happening. He saw from when the individuals walked into the store, he noticed their suspicious behavior, he noticed the argument that had happened between them and the employees, so he was prepared and he was standing right outside of the super center to be able to stop them. So this is an example of a situation where things seem to be out of control, things seem to be in chaos, but in reality, there was someone who was in control and know what the situation is. Now, we all live in a world we see a lot of evil, we see a lot of sin that is happening, and we can wonder whether God is in control. Because we see that things seem to be out of control. We notice it in our lives, we noted it, notice it in our families and in the news that is around us. But the reality is that God is in control. God is sovereign. So this is a theological word, God sovereignty. Sovereignty simply means that God is in control of everything. After all, God is the one who created the whole world. God is omnibenevolent, meaning that he is all-loving. God is omniscient, meaning that he is all-knowing. God is omnipotent, meaning that he is all-powerful. And God is omnipresent, meaning that he is everywhere. So as a result, because of, of these characteristics of God and how great that he is, he is sovereign. He is in control. He knows everything about your life, including the plan of for it, from the past to the present and to the future. And he directs and orchestrates it in, his, in the way that will be for your benefit, for your good, for your salvation. But the reality is that in our lives, we can find it hard to see whether God is actually in control, especially when things don't go right in our lives, especially when there is sin and evil in the world and those, the, the consequences of those sin and evil affects our lives negatively. When someone hurts you, when there is injustice. So it is hard to see whether God is in control. And, and when those cases come, we may want to be in control. We may want to try to take control and try to be in charge of our own life. That's one way of how we may try to respond. But again, I'm here to say that God is sovereign and God is in control. How so? As we look into our passage, we can be able to see and understand God's sovereignty and how he is in control of everything. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to please take them out. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10, we're going to focus on verses 5 to uh, 34 today. If you don't have a Bible, you can find one under the seats in front of you, and I believe for those Bibles, you can turn to page 561 for that. Since the beginning of February, for these past like, weeks, we have been in a sermon series through the book of Isaiah that is entitled, Rescued and restored. So since this is a long passage that we're reading here in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 10, uh, we're going to not read the whole thing all at once, but we're going to read it in small little sections as we go along. And we're going to see how God is sovereign and in control, especially in the most difficult times. So if you'd like to take notes, I encourage you to write this question down that we will be uh, uh, that we'll be focusing on today. How does our sovereign God demonstrate that he is in control of everything? How does our sovereign God demonstrate that he is in control of everything? And as we uh, go through this uh, passage, again, we'll be able to see that there are three ways. Three ways that shows how God can demonstrate how he is in control of everything. And in, in the context of this passage that we will read, we'll see that the nation of Assyria had just conquered 
the kingdom of Israel, you know, God's own people, and destroyed some of their own cities. So they were wondering, how could God be in control? But before we go into this passage, I invite you all to bow your heads with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you for bringing us on this uh, Sunday morning to be able to worship you, to be able to uh, fellowship with one another. And I pray that you would teach us this morning through your word. Lord, we can be able to wonder how things can be in control, especially if you are a good God. We pray that you will help us to see that you are in control in the midst of the sin and the evil that we may experience and see in this life. Maybe some of us may feel far away from you. Maybe some of us may be going through a hard time right now. No matter what is the case, I pray that you will be able to teach us and show us the, the way. Father, we thank you. Lift up these things in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. So let's go to our, pa our passage again. We're here in Isaiah chapter 10. The context is that Assyria had just attacked the kingdom of Israel, and Israel was wondering, how could God be in control? And we'll see how that he is in control. Let's start reading from verse 5 of uh, Isaiah chapter 10. Verse 5. Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to take the spoil and seize plunder, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. So here, we see that God has said that he has used the nation of Assyria to be able to attack and discipline the nation of Israel. So God used Assyria as a tool. So he describes him as uh, a staff, as a rod that God would use to discipline Israel. Now why? Why would God need to discipline Israel, his own people? Read verse 6. It says, against a godless nation that I sent him. Now, the reality is that Israel had turned away from God. Now, that's why it describes here that they are like a godless nation. Now, last time when we were in chapter 9, we had focused on how God's discipline is a form of love, a form of grace to us. Now, because he loves us, he would discipline us so that he, people can have the opportunity to turn back to him and to be able to repent. So this is why God was disciplining his own people. So the question is, does the nation of Israel know that they're being used as an instrument by God to be able to discipline the people of Israel? Do they know about that? Let's read verse 7 and see. It says, but he, this is talking about Assyria, he does not so intend, and his heart does not think so. So the answer is no. Assyria doesn't know that they were being used by God to, be dis to discipline the kingdom of Israel. So even though God had used them to discipline Israel, this is not the intention that was in their heart. Israel didn't say, oh, you know, the God of Israel, you know, they want us to be able to go and attack and discipline the nation of, of Israel. And let's, let's do a favor for God. No, Assyria wasn't thinking in this way. This is not their intention. This is not what was on their heart. Then what is their intention? What was on their heart? Let's continue on. Read back in uh, verse 7. It says, But it is in their hearts to destroy and to cut off nations not a few. So what is on their heart is that Assyria had the intention to dominate, to kill, and to destroy other nations that are around them. In their hearts was full of sin and full of evil. And we can see how the sin and evil is expressed as the king of Assyria speaks. So here in verse 8, this is the king of Assyria who is seeking, speaking. For he says, are not my commanders all kings? Basically, Assyria is very proud and say, look at how great our armies are. Our commanders are like kings. We can be able to attack and take down any nation that is around us. And not only that, if you read verse 9, three different questions are asked comparing two different cities. Verse 9, is not Kalfno like Carchemish? Basically, this is saying, oh, will not Kalfno eventually be like Carchemish, will be destroyed? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Wouldn't the nation of Hamad be destroyed by us, just like Arpad was? Or is not Samaria like Damascus? Will, not, will we not be able to destroy Samaria, just as we have destroyed Damascus? This is the evil and the sinfulness that is in the nation of Syria's heart. They were here just to dominate, to kill, and to destroy other nations around them. It is their heart is of sin and evil. 
So it is not something that surprised God. You know, God is all-knowing. God knows what was on the serious heart. And it's not that God can't do anything about their sin and evil. Yes, God can be able to address their sin and evil. He is all-powerful, and He is doing something. But despite a serious sin and evil attention to destroy and, and kill other nations that are around them, God is sovereign. God is in control. He did something about it. And what did He do? You know, he used the nation of Israel, as we said, to, for a greater purpose of disciplining Israel, His own people, and he was able to use Assyria to give his people Israel an opportunity to repent and to turn back to him. Let's answer our question. How does our sovereign God demonstrate he is in control of everything? Here's the first way. Our sovereign God can use the sin and evil of others for his purpose. Our sovereign God can use the sin and evil of others for his purpose purpose. Now let me give you a few examples of how this can happen. So there's one was a, a girl named uh, Kim Kalish. So she lives in New York City, and as a high schooler, you know, she, at this time, like, she, it was, it's really uncool to ride the school bus to go to school, especially as a senior, because many of those uh, other students have already dr driven themselves to be able to school. But at this time, she can't be able to drive herself yet, so she had to rely on her father at times to drive her to school. She didn't want to take the school bus. But her father, not all the time, can be able to drive her because you know, he had to go to work at times. Well, one day, she didn't want to take the school bus, and her father wasn't able to drive her. So she was very frustrated about it. She yelled and she screamed at her father. She went outside and on purposely missed the school bus. So when the school bus came, she just waved it away. And then she went back to her father and said, see, I missed the school bus. Now you have to drive me to school right now. You know, her dad was angry. It was very livid, and you know, she, he, he just took her and dropped her off at school. And as she was getting out of the car, he said, if I miss this meeting at work today, then you are dead when I get home. So there's an argument between them, and uh, Kim basically said, I don't care. And she just walked right into school. This day is in the year 2001, on September 11th, the day when <coughs> the airplanes had hit the Twin Towers in a terrorist attack in New York City. Her father worked in the North Tower of, uh, uh, during 9-11. But because she, essentially, you know, she had sinned, she had caused this anger between her and her father, and she missed the school bus, she, she made her father late to work, and, in, and, and when the airplanes had hit the, nine, uh, the, the towers, her father wasn't there. So unknowingly, she had saved her father's life. Because if he went to this meeting on time, he would have probably perished in the 9-11 the attack. You see, even though in her sin, wanting to be in control, wanting to be driven to school, dis disrespecting her father, God used her sin for a greater purpose and ended up saving the life of her dad. This is an example of how God can use the sin and evil of others for his greater purpose. Now, another example, you know, still sticking on the theme of 9-11. You know, it's obviously that there is sin and evil intentions from Al-Qaeda and bin Laden when they wanted to terrorize and attack the ten Twin Towers in America. But even despite this, do you know what happened right after 9-11? Many Americans, really thousands of Americans, started flocking to the churches, seeking for God and wanting to find some answers. Well, this is another example of how even though there was sin and evil intention from terrorists who attacked our nation, that God could still use that evil for his greater purpose because it led a lot of people to come back to him and to come back to church. Let me share another example that we can find from Scripture in the Bible. Many of you know of the story of Joseph. You know, Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons, and his father, Jacob, had loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. You know, gave him even a, a colored uh, cloak. And his brothers were so jealous of him that they beat him up, they threw him in a ditch, and intended to leave him there to be able to die. But instead, they sold him into slavery, and they told his father that, oh, 
Joseph was killed by a wild animal. So there was sinf- sinfulness. There was evil in every way that they had treated their brother Joseph. So Joseph was taken to, uh, into Egypt as a slave, and years later, he actually had risen to a position where he served as a steward to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. In this high position, and in the midst of a famine that was going on years later, Jacob and his sons came to Egypt, and they were basically asking for food because they had no food at all. They were going to die from starvation. And because Joseph was in this high position of power, he was able to invite his family to live in Egypt so that they can be cared for, so they can be fed, and their people can be saved from starvation in this famine. See, if they didn't survive, they wouldn't grow to be the nation of Israel that we read about in God's plan, in in God's purposes. So God used the evilness and the sinfulness of Joseph's brother, even though they attacked him, they were jealous of him, and they sold him into slavery to be able to one day have Joseph be in this high position of power in Egypt to save his own people from a famine. If you look at Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, this is what Joseph says to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So in all these examples that I shared, we see how God is in sovereign control of everything. Nothing surprises him. He can be able to orchestrate everything, and he uses the sinfulness and evilness of others for his purposes. Again, how does our sovereign God demonstrate he is in control of everything? The first way, our sovereign God can use the sin and evil of others for his purpose. And now back in our passage here in uh, Isaiah chapter 10, see, God had used the sin and the evilness of the nation of Assyria to be able to discipline Israel, his own people, and to give them an opportunity to return back to God. Another example of how God uses the sinfulness and evilness of others for his purpose. Now, what does this mean for us? How does this apply for us then? I think we need to remind ourselves that, yes, God is sovereign. God is in control of everything. Again, in a world where there seems to be be so much evil, sin, and chaos, We need to know that God is in control, and nothing happens that is beyond what God allows and what God can be able to know. He can use the sin and evil uh, for his purposes, even in the terms of the trials in our own personal lives as well, even when we may not understand it. So if we know in the back of our minds that God is in control of everything, then even in the most hardest situations of our lives, we can have a level of comfort and hope and peace. But let's say that there is someone who is going through a, a hard time right now. Let's say a, a tragedy has, has struck. Maybe something bad had happened in their life. Uh, someone had passed away. And they may ask and wonder, how could a good and loving God allow for this type of evil to happen? And I think in reality, many of us may ask the same questions when we experience it as well. See, at this moment, if someone asks that question, I think at that time, they don't need a very big theological answer. Oh, oh, God works all things for good for those who love and obey him. Uh, That God is going to use this evil that happens in your life for a greater purpose. No, they don't need to hear that right now. Right now, they just need to be reminded that God is in control. That God loves and cares for them. Because not until usually later, after they have uh, recovered, after they have uh, been able to... uh, go past this situation, this tragedy, that they can be able to see afterwards how God actually was using this situation, how God was actually in sovereign control. Again, no matter what happens, know that God is sovereign and how he is in control. Now, many of us can be able to know and understand this first point, how, okay, if God is in control of everything, he can use the sin and evil of others for his purposes. He is in control. But then we may wonder, whether God would be a good God while still using or allowing the sin of an evil of others for his purpose. Now think about it. Why would God, if he is really good, use an evil nation like Assyria for his purposes to discipline his own people, such as Israel? Why would God allow for the Assyrians, in a sense, to get all the wealth and all the power and allow them to conquer all these nations and, and destroy them? We question God as a result. Is God good for allowing evil? Is God doing anything to be able to to stop this evil? You know, this is the same question that we may ask as well. We may also ask, why do good things happen to bad people, like like the Assyrians here in in this uh, this chapter? 
And why do bad things happen to good people? Some more questions that we may ask and wonder as we deal with God's sovereignty and how he is in control. Why does the intoxicated driver survive a car crash unharmed while the sober victim are seriously injured or even killed? Why do racism seem to happen and seem to go unpunished in our lives? Again, these are questions that we may ask, and we may wonder whether God is good, a, a good God, if he can use and, or allows for sin and, even, and evil to exist. See, this is how some people may be able to, uh, to think. Think of this uh, uh, situation. Can a good God exist and allow evil? So this is how some people may think. Number one, in all lo- knowing God, would have known that evil exists. Number two, an all-loving God would want to prevent evil from existing. Number three, an all-powerful God could prevent evil from existing. But number four, the reality is that evil does exist. So five, therefore, there cannot exist an all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful God. He is evil. Now, many of us may think in in these terms, but is this the case? No, I don't think so. We cannot conclude that God doesn't exist or that God isn't good or that he's evil just because there is evil in the world. So rather, I would uh, argue for the following, that the presence of evil shows that God is all-loving. How so? So number one, God is an all-loving God. Number two, an all-loving God would not force humans to love and obey him. Number three, an all-loving God would give humans the free will to love and obey him or not. Number four, there are humans who freely choose not to love and obey God. So five, therefore evil and suffering exist as a consequence of sinful choice. So really, what this is saying that there is evil in the world because God had created human beings with free will to choose right from wrong. And it's necessary for God to give this free will as an all-loving God. If humans don't have free choice, then basically God would be forcing everyone to do nothing but to only to love him and to do good. So forced love is not characteristic of an all-loving God. So therefore, it's necessary for humans to have free will. And when there's free will, evil and suffering results when humans choose not to obey God. See, this is the reason, and this is why we see a lot of evil and sin in the world we live in. This is the reason why we see a lot of hurts from the consequences of the sin that that people choose as they uh, disobey God. So as a result, we can't conclude that God doesn't exist or that God is evil just because there is the presence of evil. But if God really is all-loving, if he really is sovereign and in control of everything in our lives, is he doing anything about sin and of evil? Is he doing anything? We say, yes, he is doing something. Let's return back to our question. How does, God, how does our sovereign God demonstrate that he is in control of everything? Here is the second point, the second way. Our sovereign God cannot overlook sin and has a plan to defeat them. Our sovereign God cannot overlook sin and evil and has a plan to defeat them. Let's return back to our passage. Again, here we see that the evil nation of Assyria is very powerful, and they constantly dominate, kill, and destroy other nations that are around them for personal gain. Is God doing anything to stop it? Yes. Let's go back to our passage, Isaiah chapter 10. Read verse 12 with me. Verse 12. When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes eyes. So here, after God uses the nation of Assyria in their sinfulness to be able to discipline Israel and Judah, his own people, so that they can be able to return back to him, to be able to repent, he doesn't overlook the nation of Assyria's sin. He doesn't overlook their evil. He will punish them and bring justice. And if you have a chance to read from verses 16 to uh, 19, you will see in more detail how God will go about punishing the nation of Assyria in their state of unrepentance. Uh, Until really, their numbers are so few that even a child can be able to count them. So ultimately, God had uh, basically defeated the the nation of Assyria in 612 BC when he used the nation of Babylon to defeat them. So the the question that we want to ask again is, 
you know, we may see sin and evil and wickedness in this, wor in this world. We may see racism. We may see discrimination and greed and justice and war. Is God doing anything about it? So here, as we've seen from our passage, yes, God cannot overlook sin and evil. God is doing something to defeat them. Remember that God knows and he sees everything, especially even the times when we suffer from the consequences of sin and uh, injustice from other people. God will not overlook sin. No, there is punishment because God is a good and a just God, and he can do so because he is sovereign. He is really in control of everything in our lives. Now, if he is in control of everything, but he doesn't do anything to stop and punish evil, then we can, then we can start to question God's goodness and evilness. But so far, that is not the case. God is in control of everything. He is sovereign. So even though God had to deal with the sin and the evil of Assyria, there is actually another aspect about them that may, may, that may be relatable to us. So aside from the sin of like attacking other nations, let's see what else is in the depth of their sin. I want you to turn to our passage. Let's read verses 10 to 11. Let's read about Assyria's pride and arrogance. From uh, verse 10. This is the king of Assyria speaking. He says, As my hand had reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols as I have done to Samaria and her images? Really, in these verses, basically the, the kingdom of Assyria is saying, I am more powerful than God. You see, I was able to defeat all these nations and their idols and gods. You know, these idols and gods that these people supposedly trusted in to be able to protect them. So if I, as the nation of Assyria, was able to defeat these nations, that means I am more powerful than their gods. And at the same time, what did they do? They also defeated Israel. So they're also thinking, I am better and I am greater than the king. The, the God of Israel as well. And now, if we can just defeat uh, Samaria, we can also defeat Jerusalem. So now we're coming to attack the kingdom of Judah as well. So in their pride, in their arrogance, basically they're saying, I am more powerful than God. What else would Assyria be saying? Let's continue on. Read verses 13 and 14. Again, this is the king of Assyria speaking. For he says, by the strength of my hands, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I have understanding, I remove the boundaries of people and plunder their treasures. Like a bull, I bring down those who sit on thrones. My hand has found like a nest the wealth of the peoples, and one, as one gathers eggs that have been forsaken, so I have gathered all the earth, and there is none that moved a wing or opened the mouth or chirped. So from these verses, the king, the kingdom of Assyria is basically saying not only that they are more powerful than God, that, but basically that I am God. I am God, and I am in control of everything. It is by my strength and my power and my wisdom why I was able to destroy and defeat all these nations. It's by my strength and power that I can be able to take of all the spoils and plunders, just like how someone can be able to steal eggs from an abandoned nest. Essentially, Assyria is saying, I am God in control. So I am more powerful than God, and I am God in control. Basically, we're saying, I don't need God at all. But the reality is that we can also fall into the same pride and fall into the same arrogance as the people of Assyria. Basically, as they look at their own accomplishments, as they look at their own, own lives. Yeah, we, we may not be as bad as them. We not, may not be attacking other nations, murdering or killing other people. But the reality is that we may have the same heart of pride and arrogance. We may also rely on our own strength and our own wisdom in what we accomplish in this life. Look what I was able to do. Look at this job that I have. Look at the grades that I got. Look at the school that I got into. Look at my, 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 my job. Look at how much money I'm making. We can think in the same way, I don't need God. In a sense, I'm more powerful from, uh, than God because I'm in control of my life. I was the one who, who did this and provided of all this as well. See, at the same time, we can be able to really attribute all the accomplishments in our lives to ourselves rather than to what our sovereign God can be able to provide for us if he really is in control of everything. See, we say amen. We want God to be good. We want God to be just. We want him to deal with the sin and evil that we see in this life. But we can also forget that God has to deal with the sin and the evil that is in our lives as 
well. After all, God is sovereign. He is in control of everything. Our question again, how does our sovereign God demonstrate he is in control of everything? Our sovereign God cannot overlook sin and evil, and he has a plan to defeat them. This doesn't apply to the sinfulness and evilness of other people. It applies to the sinfulness and evilness of our own hearts as well. But there is hope. If God is doing something about the sin and evil in our lives, what is he doing? So what is God doing about sin and evil? Number one, God revealed in his law about what is wrong. He shows and revealed to us what is good and what is sinful. Number two, God gave us a conscience to know what is wrong. In the the ability of how he created us, he gave us this notion and this sense that there is good and evil, even when we don't know explicitly what it is. We have a conscience. Number three, God gave us the power to be able to do right by his grace. A lot of times we find that there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of temptations, and we don't think that we can be able to do what is right. But as Christians, God can give us the power and the strength needed to be able to obey him by his grace. Number four, I think one of the most important things, God sent Jesus to defeat evil officially at the cross. Yes, God is doing something about the evil and sin in our lives. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, to be able to pay the price and the penalty of our sin so that for those of us who put our faith in him, we can find salvation. We can find hope, forgiveness of of our sins. And then, number five, God will send Jesus to defeat evil in actuality when he returns to this earth. Satan, sin, and evil, everything will be completely defeated in the future. Again, because God is sovereign and God is in control of everything, he already has a plan set in place to defeat sin and evil. Ever since Adam and Eve had sinned in the Garden of Eden, the plan was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and paid the price for our sin. Evil will be completely defeated when Jesus returns in the future. So yes, God is sovereign. He is in control, and he is working in your life as well. Where you are right now, which family that you are born in, which school, what job that you have, all the good things and all the bad things that happen in your life, God knows, and God had orchestrated it in a way so that you can be able to be at a point where you can hear the good news, so that you can be able to know him and to be able to believe in him. Really, even the fact that you are here today in this worship service, listening to this sermon, is a part of God's sovereignty working in your life. God is pursuing you. God is reaching out to you. He has a plan to be able to save you from your sin. Again, our question, how does God, our sovereign God, demonstrate he's in control of everything? Our sovereign God cannot overlook sin and evil, and it's a plan to defeat them. So as we continue on in this uh, passage in Isaiah chapter 10, there is one more way of how our sovereign God can demonstrate that he is in control of everything. I want us to jump over to verse 20 and read from there. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20. It says, In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of those of the house of Jacob will be no more, would no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. So here, Isaiah then presents a message of hope to the people of Israel and to Judah. God promised that the people of Israel that there will be salvation from the Assyrians. They will be de- defeated. They will be brought to justice for their sin and, and evil. And as a result, there will be a remnant. There will be a few people who are left who will be able to trust in God fully and no longer trust in Assyria. Because you see, in the past, the people, the reason why they were even attacked in the first place is that they were taken advantage by the nation of Assyria. They had trusted that Assyria would be able to provide for them. But as a result of their trust, instead of trusting in God, that's why they ended up being uh, attacked. So now God is saying that there is hope, there is salvation. He will save them from the Assyrians, and there will be a remnant, a people who's left, who will trust in God instead of trusting in the Assyrians. So now as we continue on, the, P- Isaiah now addresses the people of Judah instead of the people of, uh, of Israel. In verse uh, 24, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you, as the Egyptians did. 
So here, God reminds the people of Judah, likewise, to also trust in God. Do not be afraid of the Assyrians when they come. Why? Why trust in God? So as you see here, God gave them a reminder about how he had saved them in the past. Now, in verse 24, it says, uh, as that, and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. What else do we see? Read from verse 25. It says, For in a very little while my fury will come to an end, and my anger will be directed to their destruction, and the Lord God of hosts will wield against them a whip as when he struck Midian at the rock of Oreb, and his staff will be over the sea, and he will lift it as he did in Egypt. See here, God reminded the people of Israel and Judah of how he had saved them in the past. In their history, God saved them from the Midianites. Now, in a previous sermon, I mentioned about how the story of, in the book of Judges, of how God used Gideon to be able to defeat the Midianites with only 300 men, as compared to 135,000 men. So God, in their his- history, had saved them from the Midianites. Not only that, another reminder is given. God also reminded them of how they had saved them from Egypt in slavery. See, in the past, you know, God had sent the ten plagues. Uh, God had, uh, had, had even uh, convinced Pharaoh to let, let God's people go. And God had used Moses to lift the staff and to split the Red Sea so that his people can be able to escape. God is reminding his people of, hey, this is how I have saved you in the past. I saved you from the Midianites. I saved you from slavery in Egypt. And this is the, in the powerful way that I have saved you in. If I have saved you in the past and I am faithful, then you can trust that I can be able to save you in your situation right now. God was faithful in the past in providing and saving them, and he will be faithful in the future to also save them as well. Let's answer our question one last time. How does God, our sovereign God, demonstrate he is in control of everything? Here is the third point, the third way. Our sovereign God, who has provided in the past, is faithful. To provide in the future. Our sovereign God, who has provided in the past, is faithful to provide in the future. Again, God is sovereign. God is in control of everything, especially in your life as well. He knows everything about you, your past, present, and the future, and he has a plan of salvation for you. He is pursuing you. And you can trust that if he has been faithful to you in the past, and how he has saved and provided for you in the past, he can be able to provide for you now and in the future, and no matter what hard situation that you are in. The question is, do you trust in him? That's really the condition. Just as how he called the people of Israel to trust in him, just as how he called the people of Judah to trust in him, God is calling us now today, do you trust in me? Well, how have I saved you in the past? Well, I think one thing that we can do is think back, how has God provided for you in the past? How has God saved you from even the hardest situations in the past? If we remind about that, then it gives us hope about the future. We should share testimonies and stories with one another here in the church about what God has been doing in our lives. By doing so, we also encourage one another to trust in God and trust that he will be able to provide and be faithful in the future. We can continue to read stories in the scripture about how God had provided and worked in the people's lives. You see, in all these situations, in the Bible, and in our lives today, it is the same faithful God who is sovereign, who is in control, who can be able to provide. If we remind ourselves how he's faithful in the past to provide and to save, he will be able to provide in the future as well. God is in control of everything, and he is sovereign. Let's review everything that we've learned from this passage here in Isaiah chapter 10. Again, we've answered the main question of how does our sovereign God demonstrate that he's in control of everything? We said that there are three ways. So review, number one, Our sovereign God can use the sin and evil of others for his purpose. Number two, our sovereign God cannot overlook sin and evil and has a plan to defeat them. So not only the sin and evil of others in our lives, but the sin and evil in our life as well, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. And finally, number three, our sovereign God who has provided in the past is faithful to provide in the future. Let us continue to remind ourselves about how God is sovereign how he's in control of everything, and how he can be able to defeat sin and evil in our lives. I'm going to close by uh, sharing this uh, letter that is as it is written by God. I I didn't write this. I I found it, and I think that this is a good picture of what God may be speaking to us. So this is what this letter uh, written by God would say. My precious child, I am in control. I am sovereign. 
I am able to make things happen the way that I want them to go. Yes, I allow you to make your own choices, and I know you don't fully understand how these ideas can operate side by side, but I am able to work within and around the choices you make to cause my ultimate purposes to succeed. For this, you must trust me. Ask me about your choices and plans. My wisdom is yours if you will ask. I want to cooperate with, uh, I want you to cooperate with my plans. When the people around you don't do that, be assured, I am still in control. I will fulfill my plan. Their choices are their own, but I'm still in control. Trust me, and I'll use it for your good. Lovingly, your heavenly father, the king. <coughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you again. We may be wondering about all the sin and evil that's happening around the world. We may be so hardened by it, so frustrated by it, and we're affected by it too. But Lord, in the midst of our suffering and our pain and what we see around the world, that you are in control, that you are sovereign, that you are good, that you have a plan for us, that you will be able to defeat our enemies and save us, that you will also be able to defeat the sin that reigns in our lives as well. Lord, thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we can have a way for salvation and for hope. Thank you for changing and transforming us. And Lord, with this knowledge of your sovereignty and, and your control, no matter what happens in this life, whether good, whether bad, we know that you will be able to provide. We know that you have a, a good and greater purpose, even though when we, when we may not see it right now. Thank you for giving us one another here in the church to be able to help us to see and realize and to remind ourselves about that. Thank you for giving us your word to remind us about that as well. Lord, as we have uh, established, we want to trust you more. Help us to listen and to obey. You are a sovereign God who is in control. We thank you and want to lift up these things in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name. Amen.